This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland was given March 2, 1999. Thank you, President Bateman, very, very much. And thanks to all of you. Thank you for coming. I didn't think the day could be more beautiful than it has been outside today. And somehow I walk in here and see all of you. And it's uh, even more beautiful. It is impossible for you to know how much I love this university and how much I love you, how much I love what Brigham Young University means, what it's meant to me, and uh, a debt that I will never, ever be able to repay. Thank you, every one of you, for coming, including my mother, who's never felt I could go off to school since I was six years old <laughs> without her. With that opening hymn and choral group and that beautiful prayer as a backdrop, may I begin by noting that there is a lesson in the Prophet Joseph Smith's account of the first vision, which virtually everyone in this audience has had occasion to experience, or one day soon will, I promise you. It is the plain and very sobering truth that before great moments, certainly before great spiritual moments, there can come adversity, opposition, and darkness. Life has some of those moments for us, and occasionally they come just as we are approaching an important decision or a significant step in our life. In that marvelous account, which I think we read too seldom, Joseph said he had scarcely begun his prayer when he felt a power of astonishing influence come over him. Thick darkness, as he described it, gathered around him and seemed bent on his utter destruction. But he exerted all his powers, that's his phrase, to call upon God to deliver him out of the power of this enemy. And as he did so, a pillar of light brighter than the noonday sun descended gradually until it rested upon him. At the very moment of the light's appearance, he found himself delivered from the destructive power which had held him bound. What then followed is the greatest epiphany since the events surrounding the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ in the meridian of time. The Father and the Son appeared to Joseph Smith, and the dispensation of the fullness of times had begun. Most of us do not need any more reminders than we've already had that there is one who personifies opposition in all things, that an angel of God fell from heaven and in so doing became miserable forever. What a chilling destiny. Because this is Lucifer's fate, quote, he sought also the misery of all mankind, close quote. That's from Lehi. Surely this must be the original ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical source for that homely little adage that misery loves company. A morning's devotional could be devoted to this subject of the adversary's strong preliminary, anticipatory opposition to many of the good things that God has in store for us. But today, I want to move past that observation to another truth we may not recognize so readily. This is a lesson in the parlance of the athletic contest that reminds us it isn't over till it's over. It is the reminder that the fight goes on. Unfortunately, we must not think 
that Satan is defeated with that first strong breakthrough, which so dramatically brought the light and moved us forward. To make my point a little more vividly, may I go to another passage of Scripture, indeed to another vision. You will recall that the book of Moses begins with him being taken up to an exceedingly high mountain where, the Scripture says, he saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses. What then followed was what happens to prophets who are taken to high mountains. The Lord said to Moses, Look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands. Moses looked and beheld the earth, yea, even all of it. There was not a particle of it that he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. And he beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. This experience is remarkable by every standard. It's one of the great revelations given in human history. It stands with the greatest accounts we have of any prophet's experience with divinity. But Moses' message to you today is don't let your guard down. Don't assume that a great revelation, some marvelous illuminating moment, the opening of an inspired path, is the end of it. Remember, it isn't over till it's over. What happens to Moses next, after his revelatory moment, would be ludicrous if it were not so dangerous and so absolutely true to form. In an effort to continue his opposition, in his unfailing effort to get his licks in later, if not sooner, Lucifer appears and shouts in equal portions of anger and petulance after God has revealed himself to the prophet, saying, Moses, worship me. But Moses is not having it. He's just seen the real thing. And by comparison, this sort of performance is really pretty dismal. Moses looked upon Satan and said, Who art thou? Where is thy glory that I should worship thee? For behold, I could not look upon God except his glory should come upon me. But I can look upon thee in the natural man. Where is thy glory? For it is darkness unto me. And I can judge between thee and God. Get thee hence, Satan. Deceive me not. The record then depicts a reaction that is both pathetic and frightening. And now when Moses had said these words, Satan cried with a loud voice and ranted upon the earth and commanded, saying, I am the only begotten. Worship me. And it came to pass that Moses began to fear exceedingly. And as he began to fear, he saw the bitterness of hell. Nevertheless, calling upon God, the very phrase used by Joseph Smith, he received strength, and he commanded, saying, Depart from me, Satan, for this one God only will I worship, which is the God of glory. And Satan began to tremble, and the earth shook. And it came to pass that he cried with a loud voice, with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and he departed hence." Close quote. Always, we should quickly add, to come again. We can be sure of that. But always to again be defeated by the God of glory. Always. I wish to encourage every one of you today regarding opposition that so often comes after enlightened decisions have been made, after moments of revelation and conviction have given us a peace and an assurance that we thought we'd never lose. In his letter to the Hebrews, the Apostle Paul was trying to encourage new members who had just joined the church, 
who undoubtedly had had spiritual experiences and received the pure light of testimony only to discover that not only had their troubles not ended, some of them had only begun. It reminds me a little of President Hugh B. Brown's statement about marriage. He said he'd always been told that when he got married he would come to the end of his troubles. So we got married only to discover they were speaking about the front end. Now, that nervous laughter from returned missionaries, I'll be back to you <laughs> before the morning is over. Paul pled with these new members about the way President Hinckley is pleading with new members today. The reminder is that we cannot sign on for a moment of such eternal significance and everlasting consequence without knowing it will be a fight, a good fight and a winning fight, but a fight nevertheless. Paul says to those who thought a new testimony, a personal conversion, a spiritual baptismal experience would put them beyond trouble, to these he says, call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Then this tremendous counsel, which is at the heart of my counsel to you and the title of my remarks this morning, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye receive the promise. If any man draw back, he warns, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We are not of them who draw back into perdition." Close quote. In LDS talk, I think that is to say, sure it's tough before you join the church, while you're trying to join it, and after you've joined it. That's the way it's always been, Paul says, but don't draw back. Don't panic. Don't retreat. Don't lose your confidence. Don't forget how you once felt. Don't distrust the experience you had. That tenacity is what saved Moses when the adversary confronted him, and it is what will save you. I suppose every return missionary and probably every convert within the sound of my voice knows exactly what I'm talking about. Appointments for discussions canceled, the Book of Mormon in a plastic bag hanging from the front doorknob, baptismal dates not met, and so it goes through the teaching period, through the commitments, through the baptism, through the first weeks and months and I suppose years in the church, more or less forever. At least the adversary would pursue it forever if he thought he could see any weakening of your resolve or any chink in your honor, even if it is after the fact. This opposition turns up almost any place something good has happened. It can happen when you're trying to get an education. It can hit you after your first month in a new mission field. It certainly happens in matters of love and marriage. Now I'm back to those returned missionaries. <laughs> I'd like to have a dollar for every person in a courtship who knew he or she had felt the guidance of the Lord in that relationship, had prayed about the experience enough to know it was the will of the Lord, people who loved each other, enjoyed each other's company, saw a wonderful lifetime of compatibility ahead, only to panic, to get a brain cramp, to have total catatonic fear sweep over them, and they draw back, as Paul said if not into perdition, at least into marital paralysis. <laughs> I am not saying, I am not saying you shouldn't be very careful about something as significant and serious as marriage. And I am certainly not saying 
that a young man can get a revelation that he's to marry a certain person without that young woman getting the same confirmation. I've seen a lot of those one-way revelations. <laughs> Apparently you have too. Yes, there are cautions and considerations to make, but once there has been genuine illumination, beware the temptation to retreat from a good thing. If it was right when you prayed about it and trusted it and lived for it, it's right now. Don't give up when the pressure mounts. You can find an apartment. You can win over your mother-in-law. You can sell your harmonica and therein fund one more meal. It's been done before. Don't give in. Certainly. Don't give in to that being who is bent on the destruction of your happiness. He wants everyone to be miserable like unto himself. Face your doubts. Master your fears. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Stay the course and see the beauty of life unfold for you. To help us make our way through these experiences, these very important junctures in our lives, let me draw from another scriptural reference to Moses. It was given in the early days of this dispensation, when revelation was needed, when a true course was being set, and it had to be continued. Virtually everyone in the room knows the formula for revelation given in section 9 of the Doctrine and Covenants. You know, the verses about studying it out in your mind and the Lord promising to confirm or deny. What most of us don't read in conjunction with this is the section which precedes it, section 8. In that revelation, the Lord defines revelation. He says, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. I love that combination of both mind and heart. God will teach us in a reasonable way and in a revelatory way. Mind and heart combined by the Holy Ghost. Now, continuing the quote, he continues, This is the spirit of revelation. Behold, this is the spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground." Close quote. Now question, why would the Lord use the example of crossing the Red Sea as the classic example of the spirit of revelation? It's a classic example of a miracle, but he says it's the spirit of revelation. Why didn't he use the first vision or the example from the book of Moses we just used or the vision of the brother of Jared? Well, I'm sure he could have, but he didn't. Here he seems to have had another purpose in mind. Usually we think of revelation as information. Just open the books to us, Lord. like. What's the political significance of the Louisiana Purchase? <laughs> or the essence of the second law of thermodynamics? It's obvious that when you see those questions on a test paper, you need revelation. <laughs> Someone has said that prayer will never be eliminated from the nation's school so long as there are examinations. <laughs> but aside from the fact that you probably aren't going to get that kind of revelation because in this church we do not believe in ex nihilo creation, especially in exams. But aside from all of that, this is too narrow a concept of revelation. May I suggest how section 8 broadens our understanding of section 9, particularly in light of these fights of affliction that Paul spoke of and that we have been discussing. First of all, revelation almost always comes in response to a question. 
usually an urgent question. Not always, but usually. In that sense, it does provide information, but it is urgently needed information, special information. Moses' challenge was how to get himself and the children of Israel out of this horrible predicament that they were in. There were chariots behind them, sand dunes on every side, and just a lot of water immediately ahead. He needed information, all right, what to do. But it wasn't a casual thing he was asking. In this case, it was literally a matter of life and death. You will need information, too, in matters of great consequence. But it is not likely that it will come unless you really want it urgently, faithfully, humbly. Moroni calls it seeking with real intent. If you can seek that way, and stay in that mode, not much the adversary can counter with will dissuade you from a righteous path. You can hang on, whatever the assault and the affliction, because you have paid the price to figuratively at least see the face of God and live. Like Moses in his vision, there may come after the fact some competing doubts and some confusion. But it will pale when you measure it against the real thing. Remember the real thing. Remember how urgently you have needed help in earlier times and that you got it. The Red Sea will open to the honest seeker of revelation. The adversary does have power to hedge up the way, to marshal Pharaoh's forces, dog our escape right to the water's edge, but he can't produce the real thing. He cannot conquer if we will it otherwise. Exerting all our powers, the light will again come the darkness will again retreat. Our safety will again be sure. That is lesson number one about crossing the Red Sea, your Red Seas, by the spirit of revelation. Lesson number two is closely related to it. It is that in the process of revelation and making important decisions, Fear almost always plays a destructive, sometimes paralyzing role. To Oliver Cowdery, who missed the opportunity of a lifetime because he didn't seize it in the lifetime of the opportunity, the Lord said, you did not continue as you commenced. Does that sound familiar? to those who've been illuminated and then knuckled under to second thoughts and fears and returning doubts. It is not expedient, the Lord said, that you should translate now. That must have been language very, very hard for Oliver to hear. Behold, it was expedient when you commenced, but you feared. And the time has passed, and it's not expedient now. Every one of us runs the risk of fear. You do and I do. But did you catch the line I tried to emphasize as I read that rather long account from the Pearl of Great Price? For a moment in that confrontation, and I quote again, Moses began to fear exceedingly. And as he began to fear, he saw the bitterness of hell. That's when you'll see it, when you are afraid. That is exactly the problem that beset the children of Israel at the edge of the Red Sea, thus lesson number two. It has everything to do with holding fast to earlier illumination. The record says, and I quote, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, 
the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. Some, just like those Paul had described earlier, said, let's go back. This isn't worth it. We must have been wrong. That probably wasn't the right spirit telling us to leave Egypt. What they actually said to Moses was, Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And I have to say, what about that which has already happened? What about the miracles that got you here? What about the frogs and the lice? What about the rod and the serpent, the river and the blood? What about the hail and the locusts and the fire and the firstborn sons? How soon we forget. It would not have been better to stay and serve the Egyptians. And it is not better to remain outside the church, nor to reject a mission call, nor to put off marriage, and so on and so on and so on forever. Of course our faith will be tested as we fight through self-doubts and second thoughts. Some days we'll be miraculously led out of Egypt, seemingly free, seemingly on our way, only to come to yet another confrontation, like all that water lying before us. At those times we must resist the temptation to panic and to give up. At those times, fear will be the strongest of the adversary's weapons against us. And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the revelation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you. In confirmation, the great Jehovah said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. That's the second lesson of the spirit of revelation. After you've gotten the message, after you've paid the price to feel his love and hear the word of the Lord, go forward. Don't fear, don't vacillate, don't quibble, don't whine. You may, like Alma, going to Ammonihah, have to find a route that leads an unusual way. But that's exactly what the Lord is doing here for the children of Israel. Nobody's ever crossed the Red Sea this way, but so what? There's always a first time. With the spirit of revelation, dismiss your fears and wade in with both feet. In the words of Joseph Smith, brethren, and I would add sisters, Shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backward. Courage on, on to the victory." Close quote. The third lesson from the Lord's spirit of revelation in the miracle of crossing the Red Sea is that along with the illuminating revelation that points us toward a righteous purpose or duty, God will also provide the means and power to achieve that purpose. Trust in that eternal truth, please. If God has told you something is right, if something is indeed true for you, he will provide the way for you to accomplish it. That is true of joining the church. It is true of getting an education, of going on a mission, getting married, any of a hundred worthy tasks in your young lives. Remember what the Savior said to the prophet Joseph in the sacred grove. What was the problem in 1820? Why was Joseph not to join any other church? It was at least in part because, quote, they teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, 
but they deny the power thereof. Close quote. God's grace is sufficient. The Lord would tell Joseph again and again through those early difficult days that just as in the days of old, these modern children of Israel would be led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. Therefore, he said, let not your hearts faint. Mine angel shall go before you, and also my presence. And in time ye shall possess the goodly land. What goodly land? Your goodly land. Your promised land. Your new Jerusalem your own little acre flowing with milk and honey, your future, your dreams, your destiny. I believe that in our own individual ways, God takes us to the grove or the mountain or the temple, sometimes the privacy of our own bedroom or closet, and there shows us the wonder of what his plan is for us. We may not see it as fully as Moses or Nephi or the brother of Jared did, but we see as much as we need to see in order to know the Lord's will for us and to know that he loves us beyond mortal comprehension. I also believe that the adversary and his pinched, calculating little minions try to oppose such experiences and then try to darken it after the fact. But that is not the way of the gospel. That is not the way of a Latter-day Saint who claims as the fundamental fact of the, rever of, of the Restoration the spirit of revelation fighting through darkness and despair, and pleading for the light is what opened this dispensation. It is what keeps it going, and it is what will keep you going. With Paul, I say to all of you this morning, cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye receive the promise. I acknowledge the reality of opposition and adversity, but I bear witness of the God of glory, of the redeeming Son of God, of light and hope and a bright future. I promise you that God lives and loves you, each one of you, and that he has set bounds and limits to the opposing powers of darkness. I testify that Jesus is the Christ, the victor over death and hell and the fallen one who schemes there. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true, and it has been restored, just as we have sung and testified this morning. Fear ye not. And when the second and the third and the fourth blows come, fear ye not. The Lord shall fight for you. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence in the sacred and holy name of our protector and redeemer, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland was given March 2, 1999.